Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for waiting. Uh, we just need to uh, put on a slide. Uh, yeah, it is. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, webinar, Cancer of the Nose, What You Need to Know. Uh, this event is co-organized by the NPC Society of Malaysia and Faculty of Dentistry, University of Malaya, and supported by the Cancer Survival Support Group, CSSG, and Society for Cancer Advocacy and Awareness Coaching, SCAN. I am Yap Lipa, the President of the NPC Society of Malaysia, and also the moderator for today's uh, event. Today, we are going to talk about a cancer type called uh, NPC. The full name is nasopharyngeal carcinoma. I think probably the full name is not that easy to pronounce, so many people usually call it nose cancer. NPC is a major health uh, issue in Malaysia. It has been uh, one of the top five cancers for the past 20 years. And NPC Society of Malaysia was established in uh, two, uh, 2010 to support uh, research on NPC and to promote uh, awareness and knowledge on this disease. It is our great honor to uh, have Dr. Liu Yu Tong today to tell us what we need to know about this disease. We will have Q&A session after Dr. Liu's talk. If you have any question, please type in into the Q&A box. Today's agenda also includes two videos from our supporting partners, which I will uh, introduce more a bit later. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Liu is an ENT surgeon at the University Malaya Medical Center. He received the, his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degree from University of Malaya, and later a master degree in head and neck surgery and as well. During his master training, he was posted to several hospitals across Malaysia, including Queen Elizabeth Hospital KK Sabah, where he saw a lot of NPC cases. He then came back to UM as a lecturer and was awarded a fellowship in head and neck surgery in Korea. He is also a member of the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh, UK. Apart from clinical work, Dr. Liu is also very active in doing research and he is a principal investigator of several projects, including a project that characterizes clinical features of MPC patients with different ethnicities in Malaysia. Today, he's going to share with us some basic and yet very important information on MPC. Dr. Liu, uh, your, the, the screen is yours. Okay, very good morning to everyone here. And it's a very good introduction from, uh, uh, kind introduction from Dr. Yap. And I'm very glad that I'm giving up, being given the opportunity to speak on this uh, public, public health topic on NPC. Uh, so um, uh, millions of thanks to NPC Society as well, the CSSG group, and also the SCAN group. Okay, so I'm just going to share my slides here. Huh? Okay, I hope everyone can see my slide right here. You'll be able to, I think. Uh, yes, I can see clearly. Mm, okay, so the public health topic today is on the cancer of the nose. And I'm here to tell uh, whoever present here what you should know and what you all need to know about nose cancer. Uh, the focus of this topic is basically is what Dr. Yap has mentioned, uh, the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, nasopharyngeal cancer. It's, it's a bit difficult to, to pronounce it, especially for general people. Uh, so uh, it's okay, bear with me. I will go uh, bring you around to, to, to understand more about this cancer. Again, I'm Dr. Liu. I'm a currently a practicing, practicing ENT surgeon in University of Malaya Medical Center and also the specialty center. Uh, in the faculty of medicine. So, as for nose cancer, uh, general population, the general people will label all sorts of cancerous growth from the human nose as nose cancer. 
But again, the topic of, of, of this public health talk is, is on nasal pharyngeal cancer. Uh, let me guide you and show you where the cancer arises from. Uh, for a uh, uh, human being nose consists of multiple compartments. This is the diagram. It's a very simple diagram looking from the side, uh, showing a uh, whole nose cavity of a uh, human being. As you can see from the side, from this diagram here, the main part, we call it a nasal cavity of the nose proper, is the front part of our nose. The back part of it, a small, deep seated structures. It's being called the nasal pharynx. Any cancer arises from this area is being called nasal pharyngeal cancer. This is a very important structure because it's deep seated and is closely related to multiple important vital structures in our okay, in the next region. Uh, it's just situated just below our brain, it's very close by to the upper part of our, of our backbone, and there's multiple small nodes that come up from the brain. Also, it's closely related. Any growth or advancement of this of the cancer that arises from this nasal pharynx can lead to multiple symptoms because of the invasion of the nearby structures. From this diagram, you can see a small opening here. Even this small opening is an opening that leading to our ear. Therefore, any growth over this area it could obstruct opening over here, leading to ear symptoms. Even cancer that arises from the nose, but it can lead to the symptoms that happen in the ear. Uh, COVID topic has been uh, COVID has been a very very hot topic for the past a year or two. Okay, as we all know, uh, to come to the diagnosis of COVID, uh, we need to go through a PC, PCR swab test. If anyone here has experienced being swapped, uh, being done the nasal pharyngeal swab. It must be a very, very bad experience because we have to go to about 8 to 9 cm uh, of the nose proper only to reach the nasal pharynx because the swab was from uh, the first lining from the nasal pharynx. This can imagine how deep seated this structure is. In, another, in other languages for nasal pharyngeal cancer, in Mandarin, we call it a DMI. Uh, in Malay, we call it a cancer compound signal. Here is so you being used in the community. This is a video in one of my patients. It's a normal video showing the normal pharynx. To examine the nasal pharynx, the endoscope, the scope needs to be inserted. As being shown in the video, this scope is being inserted in the right side of our nose. You can see how deep the scope needs to be inserted to examine the, the whole nasal pharynx. Okay, let, let me stop here a little bit. Okay, this is the video showing a normal nasal pharynx on the right side. This is a middle structure. Any cancer that arises from this area, well, this is the commonest area of the nasal pharynx that where the cancer arises. When the cancer starts to, starts to grow, it can go occupy full cavity and go to the right side. Oh, sorry, go to the left side. If we continue to grow up, it will be our brain. If we can appreciate the small opening here and correlate to the diagram that I show you, well, this is a small opening leading to our ear. So any growth over this area, from this area leading to the ear symptoms. A very simple introduction again on MPC. Um, any types of cancer arise that arises from this area, we call it the nasal pharyngeal cancer. Uh, it's very remarkably, remarkably prevalent in our country, especially so predominant among the Chinese population. Over the Borneo side of East Malaysia, there's a, the incidence is also very high in Sabah, Sarawak. This is especially so for one of the very special natives, a Bidayu natives in Sarawak, is being reported to have even the highest incidence of MPC over the world. Again, the picture showing the right side. I'm just bringing you through so that you can understand where, how the cancer looks like. Huh? This is the picture showing the right side of the nasal pharynx. If you can imagine, Remember back the first few slides the video I show you the nasal pharynx mucosa was totally flat. This is 
a patient with a nasal pharyngeal cancer with an enlarged mass in the nasal pharynx with a lot of dilated vessels. It's a very angry looking mass. He, he was diagnosed to have MPC from the biopsy. This is the most common features of this NPC because they present as enlarged mass. And not so typical presentation to cancer that even present as a very flat uh, abnormal outlook over this area. Let's look at data globally. Okay. Actually, looking, in, uh, looking at the nasal pharynx is actually not so common. Uh, compared to other types of cancer, breast cancer, lung, colon, stomach, cervix, esophagus, thyroid, etc. This is not even within the first 20 most common cancer. But however, again, I have to emphasize that this is very prevalent endemic in Malaysia, Asian country, and, um, and especially so the Chinese population. Uh, this uh, NPC has a very, very interesting geographical, ge geographical distribution. This is not common in African country, European country, and America. But in Asia, in Asia, it, is, it has recorded up to 85.2% of the new cases. Really, looking specifically to Chinese, you know, Malaysian Chinese has ranked the third after China and Singapore Chinese. So very important and very interesting. It was about five to ten years ago when Malaysia had started to collect data on NPC. And the data collected was about from 2012 to 2016. As you can see, at that point in time, NPC was fit most on. In five to ten years' time, uh, the data was about two years ago, it was collected from two years ago. It had done one step to become the first most common. So I have to re-emphasize that don't uh, overlook this disease. This is getting more and more common, be more vigilant in the signs, symptoms that I'm going to let you know. Okay. The right time risk for males is relatively two to two time, two to three times more common for males. For Chinese itself, in out of one one hundred people, there's one case, one new case, and as for Malays. 340 cases. And the lifetime risk for a female is, uh, is uh, one in a four of 480s. In a bimodal presentation of this disease, the incidence is peak up to the age of, uh, at the age of 25 or up to the age of 25. There's a second peak of incidence up to the age of 65 about that. We face, we ENT people has faced a lot of challenges in dealing with these kind of diseases. Uh, it's not cancer because most of the, more than 70% of people that come to us will have their stage 3 and 4. Stage 3 and 4 compared to early stage has a totally different response and the survival rate. They will usually do badly. Uh, because of a very deep seated structure, this disease usually is detected late rather than early. We have faced uh, huge challenges because they come to us in very late stage. And of course, not to forget about the treatment toxicity that we receive after the treatment. As you see, early stage are usually the symptoms are non-specific. So the talk here is to enlighten you all on the early symptoms or the symptoms that you need you need you all, all of you need to pay attention to. Uh, these factors means the possible factors that can lead to the development of this cancer is actually multifactorial. Means there's multiple factors combined together leading to the development of this cancer. The environment environmental can, uh, factors, exposure to wood dust chemicals, and diet. Diet is extremely important. Uh, chronic, long-term, large amount intake of salted fish, salted soybean or pickled vegetables, you definitely put someone at risk. Um, how much is considered significant? This is very similar if I put sneaking habit into the comparison. 
if someone smoked at a very early early age, the amount of smoke because the amount of cigarette is more, uh, the duration, long duration of smoking, there will definitely uh, higher risk being imposed to them. Okay, this is the big showing uh, the pickle fruits, uh, pickle food, vegetables, and so each. Other environmental factors, of course, we always blame tobacco, alcohol, uh, as one of the public chances, uh, which is very true for this situation. Okay, let's look at this slide. Uh, uh, very, very important risk factor for the development of this cancer is the family history, the genetics. Uh, if someone has any family history of cancer of NPC that run in the family, the first generation family members will have about 15% increase of risk to, to develop this NPC. And it's very interestingly and it's well proven that one of the virus infection persistent EBV, the virus name is called EBV, is also being considered as one of the culprit to initiate the tumor formation or cancer formation. So uh, one slide that's not on smoking, huh? because it was used in not so uh, very close relationship between smoking and NPC, but this is a definite risk factor. For a smoker, they will have 1.3 times higher risk than the non-smoker. The younger they smoke, huh? especially those start to smoke at the age of less than 16 years old, you also have a significant risk for this NPC development. And lastly, uh, uh, amount of more than 16 sticks a day. So the clinical presentation, how they actually present, what are the features that is related to this MPC? Uh, this neck swelling is the commonness. It's more common on one side when they start to develop on one side. Uh, it's also when the cancer start to develop and uh, to start to grow and go to the other side of the nasal pharynx. It can present as both neck swelling. It's always painless and the size is always about 60 to 70 percent of the NPC patient come to us with neck swelling. Okay. I don't know symptoms, maybe some bleeding or some blood stain, nose discharge, mucus or saliva. And if the tumor has grown, to a certain size, it will lead to nose block. A lot of people might think, well, uh, this nose cancer we present is very, very torrential, very severe bleeding. But for NPC, I can tell you this is not. Yes, they might have some blood stain, mucus, nose mucus and saliva, but usually they don't present with a very frank, very severe bleeding problem. Okay, this is a picture. Uh, if I show you, if you still remember my work that uh, there's a small opening from the nasal pharynx that's leading to the ear. This is a very nice diagram. When the tumor starts to grow at the nasal pharynx, uh, this orifice or this opening is being blocked by the cancer and this tube will not function well. When these tubes don't function well, fluid starts to accumulate in one side of the ear. It's severe. It can present on both sides of the ear as well. The symptoms that present is usually early symptoms. Remember, ear syndrome is always an early symptom. Blood sided deafness, echoing, ringing sound, or tinnitus in the ear. Okay. Others, other presentation will be uh, some headache in 20% of them. And of course, uh, at this time, I mentioned there's multiple smallness that comes out. Into the pharynx, which is very closely related to that structure. Uh, any increase in size of one spoon of the cancer can lead to the involvement of the nerve causing a screen. Okay, uh, a sudden onset of the screen, deviation of the tongue, because one of the nerves that control the movement of the tongue uh, can be infiltrated and causing weakness. And of course, face, facial pain over this area. And cancer, when we talk about cancer, there has the potens uh, potential and potency uh, to spread to other places of our body. Uh, the commonest spread is the 
huh? second will be liver, then followed by mouth. How to diagnose the MPC? And of course, other than the symptoms, the history of presentation is still the most important examination with the endoscope. Okay? This structure is a very, very deep structure. We need the endoscope. And of course, this endoscope you know, is uh, being used by the ENT surgeons to examine the nasal pharynx to make sure uh, and to examine and to see where is the growth of the patient. Some very early stage cancer of the nose might not even be seen from the school. Uh, some other tests, especially the scan, uh, might need to come into in play to help to support the diagnosis. But the basic of is or of, of the diagnosis is from the use of the endoscope. And of course, there are other 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 parameters. If I'm quite sure a lot of people has gone for a usual basic screening from the half screening package from certain hospitals. Some certain blood markers from the blood might indicate, but it's not 100 percent accurate. They can only indicate and give us a few, uh, but um, the, the come to the basic again, the gold standard still need the sampling of the tissue, and the tissue being sent to the lab for confirmation. This is the video of one of my patients with cancer of the nose. So I think uh, I like those on the right side. Is a tumor. I think I showed this picture before. You can see a very exuberant and angry looking. We took a biopsy from this area, and the final lab report showed an NPC unlikely. This is how we perform the endoscopic examination in the clinic setting. Uh, this is a very very small scope that we use to be uh, used to be uh, insert into the nose cavity of the patient, as you can see from far. Uh, the TV screen here show a normal nasal pharynx of this patient. Okay. When we see a growth, we use a metallic forcep to take a biopsy and the tissue later on being sent to the lab for urgent. Uh, hi, Dr. Liu. Uh, hi, Dr. Liu, can you hear me? Sorry, everybody. I think we have some uh, internet issue here. Hi, Dr. Liu. Sorry, everybody. Just uh, bear with us for a second while we try to get... Okay. Dr. Liu, you, you, you're back. Can you hear me? Dr. Liu, can you hear me? Uh, you please unmute yourself. Can you, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Your voice uh, was a little bit picking up before you and missing <laughs> uh, maybe can you, you hear me? maybe you can turn off your video when you speak yeah can you can you please turn off your video maybe uh we'll make it uh the connection better
How about now? Is it better? Uh, have you share your slides again? Maybe maybe we can try that you share your slides and you speak, but with the video off to see whether it's better or not. Okay, I'm going to share my slide. Yeah. How about this? Um, I haven't seen anything yet. You can can you see my slide? No. Oh, can. Oh. Uh, have you turned it's okay. off your, your Give me video? a second, no. Give me a second. Okay. Okay. How about now? Um, we haven't seen your slides yet. Oh, I have shared my slide. It's okay. Let me unshare. Maybe let me unshare and share again. I'm very sorry about that. It is the convenience. Oh, okay. Yeah, we How can see this now. Yes. Okay. Uh, how about this? Okay, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I I think it's okay. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, so right now, so I mentioned also before, uh, there are some imaging scan which come into play. Of course, the CT scan, MRI, to PET scan just to let you know the images from the CT scan showing a very exuberant mass on the nasal pharynx. Same for the MRI images. Okay, so quickly I come to the treatment. For the treatment of MPC, it's not only the ENT. Huh? Actually, the multiple teams being involved in managing a patient with the MPC. Okay, uh, they involve the not only ENT, the vet dental has a very important role to be in because they have to make sure the oral hygiene is good because, before they can proceed for the next step of treatment, which is the we in which the radiotherapy is the mainstay of treatment. Later on, radiotherapy will be performed and will be helped by our oncologists. So as for MPC treatment, the mainstay of treatment is still the radiotherapy. There are many types of radiotherapy. Uh, one of that proton therapy also is one of the form of radiotherapy. As you all know, uh, one of our um, uh, country hero of a national hero, Tatuk Lee Chong Wei has actually received a proton therapy for that, for his unlucky situation. Okay. Uh, so for at one stage, NPC, a lot of the time, chemotherapy need to be added on to improve the sensitivity of, and I would say to improve the function of the radiotherapy. And of course, a lot of people here uh, might uh, hear the immunotherapy before and usually this type of immunotherapy is for those advanced cancer which has gone to other place of the body or the cancer which has come back or we call it a recurrent cancer um, I think one slide to share what is the treatment uh, for recurrent cancer where the meaning is the cancer of the MPC that has come back after the full treatment the option is to re-radiotherapy again. And of course, re-radiotherapy again will be giving patient, will be giving patient a lot of toxicity and side effect. The quality, their quality of life will definitely be poor. And if the cancer is amendable for surgery, then surgery will come into play. So this is the video they're showing the surgery which has come for one of the patients with the cancer of the nose on the left side, this is the video after removal. Okay, if the cancer has been just purely localized on, in the neck region, a major surgery to remove the cancer uh, is warranted, you know, provided the cancer didn't spread to other else, elsewhere of our body. Chemotherapy, of course, but usually for palliative purposes. Okay, some slide to show how bad the radiotherapy can do to, to the, the patients who suffer from MPC. 
okay, early complication, they can have all sorts of ulcers that develop in the, the, the oral cavity, the tongue. Uh, the skin changes, uh, uh, causing all sorts of breakdown of the skin. And of course, when, that, when the patient encounters this kind of side effect, that we have very bad pain, dysphagia, altered taste, even vomiting. A chemotherapy effect usually may, may, may uh, lead to the derangement of the blood causing uh, infection because of uh, the reduction of our white cell. And of course, someone might lead to a severe tiredness and even depression. Late complication, you know, it can affect multiple nerves uh, in our body. Uh, then, of course, the long term, they will be having a serostomia, which is dry mouth. Anyone having a dry mouth, uh, a reduction in the saliva amount will might put them at higher risk to develop the fungal, fungal infection we call the oral candidiasis. Ear complication, blue ear, a fluid accumulation in the ear, difficulty in opening the mouth, and long term ear infection too. As for the nose complication, you can see this is the patient that suffered, or oh, I wouldn't say suffered, they have completed a, radio, a whole course of radiotherapy. You know, there's so much of destruction or damage to the lining or the skin within the nose cavity. They develop so much of crusting. This crusting will lead to infection or even bleeding. And the sinus, a thick pus coming up for all sorts of cavities uh, in our nose cavity. So take home message, very important for you all to recognize early features. For to diagnose the MPC, the gold standard still need an endoscope biopsy. If there's any presence of any suspicious symptoms I have mentioned to you, please refer to us for early endoscopic examination. We hope to catch more and more patients at their early stage. And lastly, early detection will definitely make the different difference in terms of survival. So a few suggestions from, from, from my team, okay? For anyone with multiple risk factors, start to start the screening process. Uh, start to see an ENT surgeon, I would say, uh, from the age of 40 or even earlier if you have more risk factors I think the risk factors I've mentioned all uh, in details to you. Screening tools, endoscope, examination of the nasal pharynx, some lab marker, which I already mentioned as well. So far, there's no fixed guideline, guideline for MPC or consensus for MPC at which age and what age is to start screening. This is basically from experience, our own suggestions. Okay. If cancer come back, uh, and of course we don't hope to cancel the comeback, uh, because whenever the cancer come back, they has a very, they usually will not do so well. So what we need to do to prevent them? So first of all, to eliminate all the potential risk factors, stop smoking, tobacco, alcohol intake, and try to avoid preserved food. And of course, please lead a very, very healthy lifestyle. For whoever who have cancer of the MPC being diagnosed, please do not default. Continue the lifelong follow-up with your doctors. This slide is to show uh, the warning sign. Uh, again, I have to reiterate the warning sign. If anyone has any of the symptoms or combination of these symptoms, please refer to the ENT as soon as possible. Again, I have to mention a painless neck, neck lump, some blood stain, nasal discharge saliva, one-sided hearing loss as early symptoms, persistent headache, face numbness or pain, double vision. Okay, so any combination of these symptoms or any presence of these symptoms persistently for more than two weeks, please right, do not overlook these symptoms. 
a lot of people will wonder uh, what ENT surgery is actually treating. You know, in a lot of laymen or general population, they might think mm, ENT, uh, they are actually treating some minor diseases of the nose, infection, sinusitis, uh, ear vac, ear wax, ear infection. But we have a very, very nice, uh, good team effort in our, in our hospital. We are dealing with all sorts of cancer. You know, we are trained in dealing with all sorts of cancer. The tongue cancer, especially this tongue cancer, where the collaboration with a dental colleague in managing all sorts of tongue cancer, voice box cancer, salivary gland cancers, and of course, thyroid cancer. If anyone has any questions, any symptoms of this, please do not hesitate to call us and to reach at least an ENT. I think that's all for, for my slide. Thank you very much. Mm. Hi, thank you, Dr. Liu, for your talk. Um, you may turn on your camera now. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much for your sharing. Uh, if anyone has uh, any question, please type it into the Q&A box. Uh, okay, let's see the question. Our first question is, does eating meal while it is still hot will put the person at risk at, for MPC? Okay, uh, I would say this is a very, very nice question. Uh, but so far, not that we know of that. Uh, taking extremely hot meal uh, will put someone at risk. But very common sense, if any of our body is chronically being exposed to a stimulus, uh, I would say it may be a possible cause. So far, they, they do not have any strong data to support that. Uh, and for us, we don't... Uh, we usually don't advise people to take their meal when the temperature is still very hot. So I, I know this is uh, taking a meal when this is still hot is actually, especially for Chinese, is a tradition. Uh, but uh, common sense tell me that this is not too healthy. Mm. So it's not advisable. Because it chronically, if you are taking it every day, every single minute, so to say, uh, you damage your mucosa, you damage any lining of our throat, uh, of our tongue. Uh, this will lead, uh, if long term exposure, if you eat may, it may lead to the changes of the DNA. Uh, this is, uh, let's say I take the another example, the voice box cancer. You know, the voice box cancer. If the voice box cancer, someone is having reflux, you know, is having reflux, long-term reflux coming from the stomach uh, to the voice box, it will lead to long-term inflammation. And this reflux and long-term inflammation uh, in, our, uh, in our voice box is actually a risk factor from even a reflux per se uh, to become, uh, to develop into a voice box cancer. So, so far, as I said, and they don't have strong enough data of taking hot meal, whether it will contribute or not. Um, I will state not so advisable if the food is too hot. Mm. Okay, so I guess everything has to be taken in moderation. Like, I yeah. guess nobody really have hot soup every meal every day for like a long period of time, right? If it's like once a week in one meal, uh, shouldn't be too panicking about it. Can yeah. is it correct to say that? Yeah, uh, I should okay. say so. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm. And um, okay, another question is, how soon will you want the dental clearance to be completed? Usually, we were given one week for clearance, uh, TCA at ENT and at primary dental care. It is not so achievable. Mm. Okay, for this question, uh, actually, it is not involving us. There's, when, 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 when something involving many teams, this may be a bit 
uh, a bit troublesome. But of course, the services from us, our job is to treat the cancer as soon as possible once it is diagnosed. But it generally, we send those MPC, newly MPC patients for dental clearance. Uh, once it is diagnosed, uh, we need to wait until the wound from the extraction heal. After the wound heal, then only they, they are eligible for the to receive the radiotherapy. Uh, so the week, a week or two before starting of the radiotherapy is a common in in and is also a routine practice for us. Hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um we saw some questions in the chat box as well. I will read it out. Uh, is proton therapy better than conventional radiotherapy in MPC treatment? Yeah, proton therapy yeah, is a form of radiotherapy also, I would say. Uh, it's very difficult to explain in detail what uh, how the physics works for proton therapy. But you just take my word, this is a form of radiotherapy. Um, but it is a very, very special type of radiotherapy that is concentrated uh, at the cancer area. Uh, for a uh, conventional radiotherapy, when the radiotherapy was being uh, shined from one side, there is an exit dose. Uh, so the exit dose and, and, and the conventional radiotherapy itself will also shine and cover some normal structures surrounding the cancerous region. So once the normal structures is being shined, uh, they are tend, they, they will tend to get damaged easily. So the proton therapy is a very, very focused type of radiotherapy so that the exposure of the radiotherapy to the surrounding normal structures is minimized. Uh, the follow-up question is, how many centers are for RT and proton therapy in Malaysia? Um, not that I know of. I think Sunway, Sunway Medical Center has one of it. Have proton uh, therapy? Hmm, if not mistaken, but not that I know of. In UEC Malaya Medical Center, the best that we have is the, not the so conventional radiotherapy, mm, but um, an upgrade of radiotherapy we call the IMRT, which is uh, one step below a proton therapy. Because I uh, understand that pro uh, proton therapy, the machine is very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, a few years ago, when I talked to the um, uh, oncologist, mm -hmm. they say Malaysia haven't got one yet. A few years ago, hopefully, I'm not sure. Uh, so maybe it's worth finding out if uh, it's necessary. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question is related to uh, the diet. Like, is ikan bilis considered salted fish? And uh, um, just I just combine a few questions like how much uh, consumption of a piece of food um, is considered significant as a risk factor like alcohol how, how much uh, uh, is considered bad uh, for these especially the preserved food the exact amount how much you take uh, for someone example when you're taking a preserved food one small plate compared to one big bowl, uh, is all, all, also very similar to the amount of smoking, I would say. Mm -hmm. So the more frequent uh, someone take preserved food, the longer duration they take, uh, um, especially, let's say, put it in an example, daily intake of the preserved food for prolonged duration, uh, you definitely, it's proven to put someone at risk. And of course, this taking in preserved food will, will put someone um, a definite to develop a cancer. No. Uh, the, the, to, for, for this MPC to develop this multifactorial, not only the food, not only the environmental factors, uh, genetics plays a very, very important role in helping, or I wouldn't say helping, uh, in initiating the tumor formation. Okay, so genetic, that's why uh, there are differences in terms of the incidence and prevalence of MPC uh, in terms of the geographical distribution. It's more towards Chinese. Too bad that we, we have in inherited the gene. But the, 
the consumption, the amount of consumption of the preserved food alone uh, may not be only one factor to initiate that. You need a multiple combination of factors who will that put someone at risk to develop that. Okay? Mm. Yeah. So uh, I, I think um, there are some publications suggest that when um, the preserved food uh, do more harm for um, like young kids, young children, if you cons uh, eat a lot of preserved food when you are very young, the risk was higher than after you, you are adult to, to eat those kind of food. Yeah. yeah so and for those preserved food, because the, they are actually, usually throughout the process, they are not... Uh, properly being processed until they, they have accumulated one's very special chemicals. We call it a nitro nitrosamines. And this is a carcinogenic. You know, it's an agent that can lead to cancer formation. So please be careful you know, of this food intake. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just now you mentioned that uh, it is multifactorial. So genetic is one of them. Yeah. Right? So if... Uh, if that, if I had like family members had MPC, uh, does it mean that I am at the higher risk of develop MPC as well? Yeah, this is for sure, uh, because genetics, uh, the inheritance, uh, play a very very important role. Um, in general, we will say ten to fifteen percent increase in risk. Uh, it's not a must someone will develop it, especially the first generation family members for someone who had the history of NPC in the family, uh, we will take it at 10 to 15%. Still, there's a lot of interaction be between the genetic abnormality or genetic changes and the other factors that I have mentioned. Okay, so can you give uh, uh, those people um, some suggestion or advice? What should they do if the family member have NPC? I would say seek uh, ENT consultation for earlier endoscopic examination, at least a yearly. If you find the first first visit, there's nothing, uh, uh, how to say, uh, conclusive. Hopefully, you don't find anything. Uh, then the best is to follow up once a year uh, with the endoscopic examination. And of course, self-awareness for this kind of relative related to the MPC patients, please be aware of any symptoms that I have mentioned, those important features. Any kind of symptoms persistently present for two weeks, do not hesitate. Come early to us. Okay? Okay. okay. So just don't ignore those symptoms mm. because sometimes it can be uh, unspecific, like you got blood in the nose, so sometimes mm. it tends to ignore it. So yeah, I think it's a very important point that people yeah. understand that. Yeah, especially those you see, uh, we've start to have a small growth in the nasal pharynx. They can, they may have uh, just excessive extra mucus, uh, than be, than usual. Uh, but a lot of people might take it as mm, nothing, uh, just treat it a normal flu. But again, persistent symptoms for more than two weeks. Don't overlook it. Come to us to be more sure. Okay, thank you. And uh, there's one question that asks about um, sensitive nose. Because I think that, um, many people have the, the nose are very sensitive, like to acorn. Is it for mm. how long for nose sensitive may cause cancer? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, uh, I don't think this is a risk factors, especially exposure to uh, aircon that leading to to to, to cancer formation. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. I don't think so. I yeah. don't think so. <laughs> okay, I think it's a, a big relief for many people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, another is uh, from a can from a MPC survival. Is that how many years do you think it is considered safe from recurrence of MPC? Despite so much of advancement in medicine, right, no one dare to say someone is cured until five years follow up without cancer coming back. Okay, we will take, still take it stick to five years. Uh, by five years, you are uh, 
you are cured uh, from that cancer. You are caught, cured from the cancer. We still take it up to five years. Uh, but you still need to have a lifelong follow-up. Uh, maybe not so frequent. Uh, okay. Okay, and then another one is about uh, environment uh, risk factor. How about the smoke from jaw steak that is used during prayer? Is it a risk factor? Mm, very good question. Mm. Again, I'm not too sure of, about jaw steak. <laughs> uh, but I will say it, uh, chronic, still a smoke, uh, still a smoke. But of course, the contents compared yeah, to the cigarette smoking is also different. Uh, I don't think there's any, any evidence support that the jaw stick that can lead to that. But um, so far, uh, yes, I think something something worth to explore more on that. Uh, thanks okay. for your suggestion. I, I, for guess, I guess it's quite difficult to decide a study to, yeah. uh, to get a... Um, a very uh, strong answer for that because we need to measure how much smoke that the person exposed to and how frequent. I think for the joystick, uh, smoke from joystick is quite, quite a challenging, quite a tricky uh, 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 study to decide. Yeah. And, uh, and we have another one is uh, undifferentiated and differentiated subtypes of non-characterizing MPC have no pronostic significance. Do you agree on this statement? Any explanation for this behavior? No. Uh, so there's a definite difference between both subtypes. Okay. Uh, oh, where's the question again? Uh, yeah. Okay, the undifferentiated and the uh, differentiated. Okay, there are big difference. That's why uh, the WHO has classified it differently because it, both of them has carried different prognostic uh, significance. For a differentiated cancer, the response to a radiotherapy, uh, the responsiveness to radiotherapy and chemotherapy is not as good compared to undifferentiated cancer. Those undifferentiated cancer will respond better but the bad side for undifferentiated cancer is uh, because undifferentiated, they're relatively more aggressive. Uh, when they're more aggressive, they have more tendency to spread to elsewhere of the body. Uh, yes, one side is they respond better uh, towards the radiotherapy uh, uh, and the chemotherapy. But now, if they are being detected early and receive treatment early, uh, we have definitely reduced the chances of the distant spread of this type of cancer. Uh, this has both different significance. Okay. Another question is, uh, since Korea has many preserved food, so is Korean will have more risk to develop NPC? Somehow in Korea, for Korea, there's actually not, not, not many... MPC developing there, or especially the new cases. Uh, maybe I would say, I, I myself is thinking whether, especially the preserved food kimchi, will kimchi actually has any protective effect for MPC? Um, again, uh, there's no study on that also. Uh, uh, something to look forward uh, for further exploration, uh, the studies on this, this area. Uh, yeah. But truly, yeah. Korean. Korean side, there are not many empty incident there is not high. The incidence is some. Maybe also uh, is as you say earlier, is multifactorial, is it? Yeah. Maybe it's yeah. more genetic and maybe the environment actually uh, environment is different. Yeah. So yeah. And uh, the risk factor, you also mentioned about EBV infection. Mm. It's a virus. Mm. Uh, is there a way to prevent it to be infected by EBV? Mm, it's actually very, very difficult to prevent EBV infection. A lot, I, I would say more than 90% of the population is already infected by EBV. Uh, where after the infection of EBV, 90-95% of them will recover 
but the EBV infection will stay in the body uh, as an inactive agent. And of course, any time they can reactivate. I mentioned in, the, in, in my slide before, the co very complex interaction between the genetic environment factors and the EBV infection. Uh, if someone has a multiple risk factors and so unlucky that the EBV reactivate, and definitely this EBV may initiate the tumor formation. The transmission of EBV is by saliva or body fluid, such as kissing, sharing of the used utensil tools. Most of the people is actually already, or already infected by EBV, and so far there's no vaccination for the EBV. I would say in general, EBV is not, is not, changed, is not dangerous. Uh, I would say COVID is more dangerous right now. Mm. Yeah, for now, hopefully. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, no I think we have answered uh, all the questions. Mm. And um, so in the chat box, uh, you can find a link to the feedback form that you can fill in anytime that you want. And an e-certificate will be sent to you after you're filling the form. So now we need to uh, move on to our next agenda. We will play two videos from our supporting partners. One is the introduction of CSSG by Mr. Jim Cow, And the other one is the a very beautiful song by Alina Murang in collaboration with SCAN to highlight this year's World Cancer Day theme, Close the Care Gap. Hello. I am Jim Kao. I am an NPC survivor since 2005. Thank you for inviting me to introduce our Cancer Survivor Support Group, or CSSG in short. Our group, which was formed 10 years ago in November 2011, by my wife and I, together with a few cancer survivor friends. We are actually a small voluntary support group of about 50 members currently. Most of us in the group are NPC survivors. We usually meet in my house in USJ, but has since gone virtual in 2020. We have provided assistance and care to about 200 cancer patients and caregiver, not only in the Klang Valley, but also outstation patients and even patients from as far as Los Angeles, United States. Learning from our experience, we understand and believe the importance of peer support for patients and also their caregivers. We like to encourage all patients to seek peer support early from the time of their diagnosis. Patients need to understand their whole treatment process before treatment. They need to prepare themselves well in order to reduce the risk of complication and better manage their side effects. Understanding and better preparation will reduce their fear level and give them the confidence and knowing that they are not alone in their battle. For NPC patient, we will discuss the possible side effect from the radiotherapy and chemotherapy, and we will guide them to manage it. We will emphasize the importance of good oral hygiene to avoid fungus growth and ulcer in the mouth. We will teach them to exercise that slightly gland, jaw, and neck. We will not only recommend their diet, but we emphasize the importance of eating well and train their brains to accept the food as it is usually a psycho problem. Post-treatment, we will discuss their new diet plan, lifestyle changes needed, short and long-term side effects, the limited treatment options for recurrent cases, which we hope new NPC research will help in this area. We would like to encourage every NPC patient to join a sub NPC support group of their choice. Our group, with experience and knowledge, is confident that the support we provide will assist NPC patients to navigate their treatment journey better and to have a better life after cancer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, I hope that you have found the videos useful. 
and hope that um, our cancer care uh, uh, system in Malaysia uh, will be improved soon. And before I end today's event, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Liu for his sharing and see SSG and SCAN for their support. And last but not least, a big thank to the co-organizer, the RMU team in Faculty of Dentistry, University of Malaya. Thank you for your participation. And we hope to see you again in our future events. Thank you. Goodbye.